Hello and welcome to the first lecture of the course Database Management Systems. Obviously, before going any further, the main question that comes to your mind is why are you here? Why are you studying databases? And how basically the databases are important in our lives? Well, the first reason for studying databases, of course, when you're studying in our university is you have to <laughs> to become engineers otherwise you won't be able to complete your degree well joke aside databases touch your life in ways you can't imagine just imagine doing online shopping from the RAS or from Amazon even accessing your online bank account you're always working directly or indirectly with the database so databases have become important because data has become important. Data has become important, data has become abundant, and data is present thus in large quantities. So to handle this large quantity of data, you have to have databases. Databases have become important because of these terms that have been shown in the slide. Data, big data. What's the term? The term means the data is available in large quantities today. Different devices are producing data. People are producing data. People are producing lots of data. Whenever you're communicating via Facebook, WhatsApp, YouTube, you're injecting lots of data into the web. So we are living in data. And since we have large quantities of data, the term big data has become very popular. Coming from that, IoT, Internet of Things. Well, data is produced not just by people, but by devices as well. And when devices are producing the data, they are coming under the category of Internet of Things or IoT. So data produced by people as well as data produced by devices. Of course, when data has become really large, enormous in size, another term, data warehouse, has become very popular. In data warehouses, we can store large and large amounts of data. You can think of a data warehouse as the next level of a database, where lots of dots of data is being stored. And of course, when you have to find your data in this large warehouses of data, you have to do something what is called as data mining. Just like you mine for coal, just like you mine for gold, you have to mine for data in this giant data warehouses. Apart from that, you can also have the term business intelligence. And business intelligence means that the people are producing the data that is valid and very important from a business point of view. For example, when you shop on Amazon, the Amazon search engine is very intelligent to recognize your pattern, your likes and dislikes, things that you want to buy. So that the next time when you log on to the system, your things of interest are shown by the system. For example, if you go and you buy a mobile phone from Amazon, so the next time you'd be logging on to Amazon, Amazon would be showing you different kinds of mobile phones that you can buy. So business intelligence, both from the point of view of the customers as well as from the point of view of the organization as well. What it means is that the organization can take the full data, for example, the data of a whole year and can analyze customer trends. The customer trends can be analyzed to find products that are in high demand and also products that are not in high demand and intelligent business decisions can be done based on those data that is gathered from the customer patterns. Let's now dive to a formal discussion about database management system from the book by Raghu Ramakrishnan. I am discussing chapter number one. So what is a DBMS or a database management system? Well. It is a very large integrated collection of data. Here the term integrated is very important because 
it is that integrated nature of the data of a DBMS that makes the DBMS so effective. For example, being integrated, the data is free from anomalies, data anomalies, data anomalies, data problems, data duplication. So this the term integrated is very important. Models real world enterprise. Enterprise is basically a big scenario which consists of different things like entities and relationships. So data basically or database in particular would be focused on entities and relationships. The term entity relationship model basically deals with the relationship between entities and their relationships. For example, what can be the entities? You being a student is an entity. Courses are an entity. In general, anything or any uh, object that has attributes is termed as an entity. You being student have the entities, you are entities because you have these attributes like roll number, name, telephone number, etc. Similarly, courses are entities. Why? Because courses have attributes like course number, course name, etc. Then we have the relationship between entities. For example, Madonna is taking CS564. So Madonna is a student and taking is a relation between the student and course. Here Madonna is the student and course is CS564. So what we can say a database management system DBMS is a software package designed to store and manage databases. So what would the DBMS do? DBMS would consist of data files where the data would be stored and DBMS would be consisting of application programs also that would be manipulating that particular data. So that uh, data uh, files and the applications would be used to store and manage the databases. Another discussion important, files versus DBMS. So to store the data, we have got two approaches. We can store the data either as files or we can store the data in a DBMS. So application must stage large data sets between main, main memory and secondary storage. So data is stored of course in secondary storage for long term storage and from that secondary storage for example hard drive data is brought into main memory where it is basically accessed or manipulated. How can that be done? It can be done by buffering, page oriented access, 32 bit addressing etc. And we have special code for different queries. What are queries? Queries is where any question that we ask the database. For example, we might ask where is student Ramiz residing? That would be a query. Or we can have a query like how many students are residing in Gulshan Ekbal? That is again an example for query. And also we must protect data from inconsistency due to multiple concurrent users. Now concurrency is a very important aspect of data. And concurrency means different users are accessing the same data. How can we do that? We can have this particular thing and we can have a little discussion that for example we can have courses right courses is an entity like we discussed before the courses entity might be accessed by a student And it might be accessed by a teacher as well. 
and i remind you that teacher is also an entity like student because teacher has got a name a department right telephone number address etc so student ki would also may also be accessing the courses entity and teacher may also be accessing the courses entity inconsistency means student should not make any bad changes to the courses table because if a student makes a bad change to a courses table there might be problem for the teacher similarly teacher should not be able to by mistake make any wrong uh, entry into the courses table which might uh, disturb the students as well so we can say that if if, if a student and teacher are both accessing the same entity courses student and teacher are having a concurrent access to the entity courses after having discussed that there is another very important aspect that's called crash recovery right problems occur all the time and computer systems are very reliable yet they are the most unreliable machines on the planet so if disaster strikes or your database crashes which means it becomes unusable so how can you recover the database i give you a very uh, interesting example data of the banks is very important and sensitive data so banks use a, a very special form of crash recovery process they make backups of their data and these physical backups of the data are stored in different physical locations for example one backup might be stored in karachi the other might be stored in hyderabad and so on which means that if there's a calamity or problem in at karachi and the backup at karachi is lost so no problem the database can be recovered from the backup stored at hyderabad so crash recovery and backup and recovery is a very important aspect and there is also security and access control student should not be able to mess with the courses entity to make any undesirable changes so that would be dealt by the security students would not be given rights to make any changes to the courses table students for example might be able to only view the courses table they won't be able to change the course identity and this can also can contains the access control we'll say that the access control of the student is such that it does not allow access to the course identity so one of the reasons for using a database is that data based management system would allow us to have different queries different questions that when you can ask for the data it the dbms would prevent from inconsistency due to multiple concurrent users or in other words dbms would offer us concurrency it would dbms would offer us crash recovery and dbms would also offer us security and access control so that is basically these are the reasons or decisions for using a dbms system so why should we use a database so database would offer us data independence and efficient access data independence is again an important term that i will be discussing later on it just refers to independence or freedom in using the data and access would be efficient because dbms system is designed to make efficient access to the stored data we have reduced application development time because we did need not worry about the storage of the data the access of the data the integrity and security of the data and data administration because integrity and security data administration are all handled by the dbms and dbms also offers us concurrent access and it offers us recovery from crashes so these all are the reasons for user for using a dbms 
and these are directly linked to the previous slide that I discussed before. So why should we study databases? Because we can shift from computation to information. We can focus on more on information rather than focusing on computation. So we can have a web space which can be a mess but in the high end we can use the database for scientific applications. Data and data sets are increasing in diversity and volume. Like I discussed in the first slide, data is produced in a large amount of quantity, big data for, for the matter, and the nature and diversity of data, the, the, the data is a lot. So, to handle these complex situations, we should study the databases. Digital libraries are there, interactive video, human genome project, EOS project, of course, when we consider any projects, the need for DVMS is exploding. So we need to have the knowledge about the databases. And DVMS encompasses most of the computer science. It also encompasses operating systems, languages, theory, AI and multimedia. So when we are studying DVMS, we would also be having a general discussion about OS, about the languages and the theory. I give you one simple example that SAP is a very imp important software, the leading business software, systems application products. And SAP is basically an application server. And this application server is running on top of a DBMS. which again runs on top of the OS or the operating system. What is the example? We can install the SAP system, pardon, it is not pronounced SAP, it is pronounced SAP. The German people are very sensitive about the pronunciation. So you should never say SAP in front of them. <laughs> you should say systems, applications and products. So this systems, applications and products or SAP system can be installed on any database and management systems. The DBMS of choice is of course Oracle. So SAP is mo installed mostly on top of Oracle. And what is the OS of choice? Linux. Red Hat Enterprise Linux or RHEL is used most often for enterprise level, large level installations of the SAP system. So now after having the discussion about the appreciation, appreciation of the databases and also some little aspects about the databases, we can now look for a term which is called data models. So a data model is a collection of concepts for describing data. Now as far as the data model is concerned, data model is one model that is basically used for describing the data. For example, I discussed about the relational model. So the relational data model is a data model that is used for describing data and it is widely used model today. So once we use any model for describing the data, for example, relational model, we can have a schema. So schema is a description of a particular collection of data using a given data model. So we can use the relational model data model to have a relational schema of our data. Let me give you an example. I discussed about the students and I discussed about the teachers. The student and teachers and the relation teachers forms a schema of our classroom. So every scenario would have a schema. I'll have more details on it later. So in the relational model of the data, the main concept is a relation. A relation is basically a table with rows and columns. I discussed in students, okay, you, you are a student, you are a relation, right? Because you have a table with rows and columns. And every relation has a schema. For example, let me give you an example. When we discuss about the student, relation 
we can have roll number name these are all the columns or fields okay there can be other fields like cgpa right telephone number address i have left those out so we'll have rows of data in this particular relation for example row number a name 12 for example row number b name 13 and so on so these would be called rows of data so the relation would have columns or fields and using those columns of field there will be rows representing a single entity so a row of this student schema or the student relation presents one entity or one student name or one student for that matter further describing the teacher student thing that i just mentioned so we can have the data model can further be represented by a diagram so relational model of data can be represented by a diagram which is called as the erd or the entity relationship diagram right so what we can have we can have an entity for example teacher and we can have an entity called student just to do less typing i am just writing the initials so teacher entity and student entity so and what is the relation between teacher and student teacher teaches students so this is one example of the entity relationship diagram which is telling us that the relationship is teaching between the entity teacher and the entity student then we have the levels of abstraction of a database right so the lowest level is the physical schema which basically deals with how the data is stored from the point of view of the of the physical file system and how basically the data would be stored in data structures and accessed and this term would be called as the physical schema based on top of that we have the conceptual schema and we can see what what basically conceptual schema does conceptual schema defines the logical structure for example this diagram that i discussed for teacher teaches students so this is basically a logical schema as can be said so this is the logical schema like i discussed before this thing and on top of that we can have views now view is the highest level of abstraction and it can combine data from multiple conceptual schemas data from multiple conceptual schemas can be combined in a view just to study at this point of thing and the right one trying to understand we can say that this is the logical schema right so this logical schema gives the relationship between the teacher and the student now the view can present the data from this schema or there might be other schemas so the view can combine data from this schema and from any other schema that is there so this is basically how the level of abstraction is organized in a database now let's look at a very good example that i have been discussing informally before now let's uh, try to have a formal view about this university database the conceptual schema is what students and the fields are student id or you can also call roll number which is of type string name is again a type of string login is again a type of string age type of integer and gps type of real because you might have 3.5 3.215 gpa then we have the courses relation which is called a course id which is again a string course name string credits integer 
and then we have this enrolled relation which gives us uh, SID student ID CID uh, course ID is a string and grade is again a string so as you can say what can you say about enrolled courses and students any idea let's say we want to represent it as a diagram what we can say we have the students entity and we have the courses entity what is the relation between student and courses enrolled so enrolled can be written in a diamond so this is how basically and you can write enrolled over here I am writing less because of this mouse so again uh, from the conceptual schema we can have the physical schema in which the physical is, uh, schema the relations can be stored as unordered files that would be low level storage and this would be handled by the DBMS and we can we can have an index on the first column of students so what is the first column of students student ID or SID well what are indexes indexes are generally used to increase the performance of a query so if we put a index on the student ID which is the first column of the student's entity whenever we search for a particular student ID this search is going to be very fast because we have set an index on the SID or the student ID one more thing I would like to refer at this point is that uh, the the fact that we are trying to speed up the access of the student ID by the field SID is called performance tuning or performance optimization so in performance optimization we see which queries are done most and we try to optimize those queries let's say in this example for example why were we putting an index on the first column of students the usage pattern has signified us that students are searched most by the student ID so if 90% of the people are searching by using the student ID if we speed up the student ID access the whole database would be speeded up so that is one of the principles of database optimization then we have the external schema which is called view and view example of view is course underscore info which contains data from the course ID or the course table and which has a field enrollment which is of type integer so views from the external schema so now let's talk a little about what we meant by data independence right and data independence means applications are insulated from how data is structured and stored this is the main idea about data independence so if we write a software program that works on top of the database let's me let me go back to that example I have just discussed uh, I discussed about SAP right SAP is an application environment that works on top of the DBMS so the software that is written in the SAP does not need to worry about how all the data is stored and manipulated because the data storage and manipulation is the responsibility of the DBMS so SAP is enjoying the independence that is offered by DBMS and this is true for any software if you write your own software that runs on top of the database your own software would enjoy data independence so what are the types of data independences logical data independence protection from changes in logical structure of data if you change the logical structure of the data for example what do, what do I mean by that let's say I introduce a new relation into the system 
or I introduce a new entity into the system. So I need not worry about how that new entity would be stored because the DBMS would take care of mapping my logical schema into the physical schema. And the same is true for physical data independence which is protection from changes in physical structure of the data. If the physical structure of the data is changed, we need not worry because that would be handled by the DBMS. So this is one of the most important benefits of using a DBMS. Of course, we can write programs easily utilizing the DBMS and without worrying about any particular aspect related to the logical data storage or the physical data storage in the system because that again would be handled by the DBMS. Then we can have the concurrency control which is again a very important phenomena. I also discussed some points in the previous uh, aspect or previous uh, moments of the course of this particular lecture. Concurrent execution of user programs is essential for good DBMS performance. So concurrent execution of user programs is essential for good DBMS performance. Which means that there might be program A also accessing the students and the teacher relation. A program B might also be accessing the student and the teacher relation. But because of this concurrency control, this access by program A and program B would be very nicely handled without any irregularities or data anomalies as they are called. One aspect is because disk accesses are frequent and relatively slow, it is important to keep the CPU humming by working on several user programs concurrently. So again, concurrency is a optimization scheme as well. Because when the DBMS is busy for slow disk access, different concurrent running programs would make the CPU um, busy and would increase the CPU utilization. So concurrency is, is essential for good DBMS performance. Interleaving actions of different user programs can lead to inconsistency. For example, check is cleared while account balance is being computed. So DBMS ensures such problems don't arise. Users can pretend they are using a single user system. That is again a very important thing. Sequence of events. Events might be occurring concurrently, but the DBMS can sequence those events so that the order of the events is not disturbed. To give you a very lively example, of course, uh, for example, if uh, we have a database system in which the student examination is modeled, right? So examination's result cannot be declared without first the schedule and conduction of the examinations. So that the DBMS system might sequence the events so that first the schedule is, uh, is uh, made using the DBMS and after the schedule is made the conduction of the examination is taking place. After the scheduling and the conduction of the examinations finally the results can be computed using a DBMS system. So Th that is the idea. Sequencing of events is also done despite the concurrency in a DPMS. Transaction is an execution of a DBMS program. So the key concept is transaction, which is a very important concept, which is an atomic sequence of database actions, reads and writes. So what do we mean by that? Uh, transaction being atomic in nature means that each transaction executed completely must leave the DBMS in a consistent state if DB is consistent when the transaction begins. In simple terms, we can say that a transaction has to occur fully or the transaction does not occur. Half of the transaction cannot occur. For example, I give you an example of the bank account, right? If you have a bank account, and let's say there is a user A and user B. So if user A 
is giving 5000 rupees to user b so user a's account should be we should deduct 5000 rupees from user a's account and we should add 5000 rupees to user b's account isn't it so this is the complete transaction that has to occur if the money transfer from user a to user b has to take place minus 5000 should be um, added to the user a and plus 5000 should be added to user b this can this should not happen that user a's account is deducted but user b's account is not added with 5000 so this would be called half transaction so half transaction is not possible either both of these operations should be done or no operation should be done so hence the term atomic and to help that users can specify some integrity constraints which are basically rules on the data and has has the term says integrity constraints constraints that are or rules that are related with the integrity of the data the user can specify and the dbms will enforce these constraints let me give you an example let's say you have a student entity right and you are talking about the item uh, let's say that we call student let's say we are talking about the student id which is of type string right now student id is a code when we talk about the name name is again of type string so a student name should not contain numbers right no one has seen a name like rahil123 stored in your official uh, uit record <laughs> right rahil amar this would be the kind of names that would be stored so we can have a constraint in the name field we can say that numbers are not allowed in name only characters are allowed that this would help us to have a good or reliable data we can also have a similar constraint constraint on the age we can say that age should always be a number age should not be a integer sorry age should not be a string age should always be a integer so this could be another constraint so constraints are important because they would ensure the integrity of the data but the dbms did not really understand the meaning of the data and the semantics of the data right so uh, it is the user's responsibility to specify re reasonable or right constraints or integrity constraints or rules on the data because if the rules are not uh, proper data entry can be very difficult as well so now when we have to schedule concurrent transactions so dbms ensures that execution of transaction t1 to tn is equivalent to some serial execution t1 dash to tn dash what it means is that before reading writing an object a transaction requests a log on the object and waits till the dbms gives it to the gives it the log all logs are released at the end of the transaction and this is called strict 2 pl locking protocol well let's look at the idea if an action of ti let's say writing x affects the transaction tj which perhaps reads x so what's happening ti wants to write to x and tj wants to read the value of x so what happens so one of them ti would get a lock on x so ti would lock x for writing which means since ti has locked x for writing no other transactions can write the value of x only ti can write the value of x and of course tj would wait for ti to finish so 
so that ti can update the value of x and tj can read that updated updated value of x so this is this uh, introduces an order to the transaction right ti has to first write to x and after that tj would read now interestingly what if tj already has a lock on y now t if, since if tj has a lock on y and ti wants to have a lock on y what would happen which means is that ti is writing y right so so sorry tj is writing y so it has created a lock on y now if ti wants to access y ti has to wait for tj and tj wants to access x to so cheat tj has to wait for ti so this is called deadlock ti is waiting for tj and tj is waiting for ti so deadlocks may occur in transactions so what is the idea how can that be resolved simple one of the process is aborted and restarted either we cancel ti and let tj complete or we can cancel tj or let ti complete and of course the aborted uh, transaction would be restarted so i discussed before that we can talk about automatic atomicity which means all or none either all transactions are occurred uh, are completing fully or they are not occurring fully and this is related to this previous example of the transfer of money i said right user a's account should be detected by 5000 and user b's account should be added by 5000 so after both of these operations then only the transaction would complete so how we ensure that we can ensure atomicity by using of course the process of a log or history of all actions carried out by the dms dbms while executing a set of transactions so these log files are very important whatever thing changes are made to the database or whatever actions are carried out on the database are recorded in a log or the history what means before a writing or a change is made to the database the corresponding log entry is forced to a safe location which is called write ahead logging or wall protocol so if any uh, any data is being changed this change would first be this this log entry would first be saved in a safe location so what is the importance of that after a crash the effects of partially executed transactions are undone using the log so that is basically the importance of the log file right so now let's analyze what is basically stored in a log well the following actions are recorded in the log the main idea basically of the log is before the changes are applied to the database all writing changes are first recorded in the log file and afterwards from the log file those would be applied to the database so the following actions are recorded in the log file transaction i writes an object the old value and the new value and this log record must go to the disk before the changed actual changed page transaction i commits slash abort whether the transaction i committed or completed this change or it aborted the status of this particular transaction so a log record indicating this action so log records are changed together by transaction id so it's easy to undo a specific transaction to resolve a deadlock remember we discussed that to resolve a deadlock between transaction i and transaction j either transaction i may be aborted to let transaction j complete or transaction j may be aborted to let transaction i complete so how that transaction would be aborted or restarted we can look together by the grouped by the transaction id and log is often duplexed and archived on stable storage 
so in all related activity uh, log activities and in fact all concurrency control related activities such as lock and lock dealing with deadlocks are handled transparently by the dbms why they are handled transparently by the dbms thanks to the log file so log file is one of the very crucial and important files of the dbms so in any enterprise level large database or even in small databases the log files are stored at multiple places they might be stored in the same physical medium or they might be backed up on a on tape storage or another backup device so finally using a databases make these folks happy and you can see how happy these folks are by looking at this figure so database makes which folks happy and users and dbms vendor database application programmers which are often called smart web master the database administrator or the dba and what is the responsibility of the dba or the database administrator very important person designs the logical and physical schemas it handles security and authorization handles data availability and crash recovery handles database tuning as needs evolve so a dba must understand how a dbms works so after having discussed all these points we can take a look at the structure of the dbms so as a typical dbms has a layered architecture the figure does not show the concurrency control and recovery components uh without the concurrency control and recovery components what are the components of uh, the structure of a dbms query query optimization and execution component relational operators files and access methods buffer management and disk space management so this is the lowest level of the db or the database which contains the physical level from on top of that we have the disk space management then we have on the top the buffer management file and access methods relational operators and on the upper layer we have the query optimization and execution so basically when we access the database database access would be done in this particular manner so summarizing dbms is used to maintain query large data sets benefits include recovery from system crashes concurrent access quick application development data integrity and security levels of abstraction gives data independence like we have discussed right logical database level physical database level and so on a dbms typically has a layered architecture like we discussed just now and dbas hold responsible jobs and are well paid so dbms r&d is one of the broadest and most exciting areas in computer science like i discussed with you about the sap right so sap admins is a very paying job so sap admins are very paying jobs and sap admins jo hai they are working and they are experts in dba they are they are expert dbas they are expert operating system personnel and they are expert sap specialists so basically as a sap specialist or sap admin would be having expertise both as being a dba and having a operating system proficiency so that sums up or ends up our discussion about chapter number 1 thank you